Neurology in the Nuffield Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford, and Steve Bates, who's Chief Executive of the Bio Industries Association. I'd like to welcome all three of our participants this evening. Uh, I'm a, also a trustee of the foundation, but actually the meeting would, under normal circumstances, have been chaired by uh, Lord Willits, uh, who is our chairman. But regrettably this evening, he's unable to join us at the last moment, because he's speaking in the House of Lords uh, and responsible some, for some amendments at committee stage in um, the uh, uh, skills and post-16 education uh, bill, where he, of course, has a remarkably important uh, contribution to make, and he sends his apologies. So on a day when many of the restrictions uh, in England have been lifted with regard uh, to um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's probably a, a, a most appropriate day for us to turn our attention to what we might learn and how we might take forward uh, what we have learned uh, in this remarkable period with regard to scientific endeavor and innovation with regard to vaccines and see how that uh, might be deployed to the broader um, life sciences agenda in our country. Uh, and in particular, how uh, what uh, might be learned can be taken forward to inform and populate the life sciences sector vision that Her Majesty's government published uh, a couple of weeks ago and which will form the basis, the roadmap for how we proceed in our country in this important area uh, not only in terms of the welfare and well-being of our fellow citizens, but in terms of the economy of the United Kingdom in the years to come. So I'm most grateful for all of those who have decided to participate this evening. Now, uh, it's an interactive discussion. We'll have uh, short presentations and then we will move uh, to a broader discussion. And in this regard, um, I'm going to turn over uh, to Gavin, our chief executive, who's going to now explain to us how we might put questions, how we will marshal those questions, and how we can be certain that we have an effective discussion. So, Gavin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, so we're going to use the Zoom Q&A function, uh, as we usually do for the Foundation events. And as always, a plea, please use the Q&A function and not the chat function, um, because with the Q&A function, you can not only ask questions, but you can also vote and upvote other people's questions and comment on other people's questions and indeed uh, potentially answer some of those questions yourself in, in a discursive way. And please don't wait until the end of the presentations. Please feel free to start asking questions uh, right from now. So you'll find the Q&A button at the bottom of, the, uh, of your screen. Uh, just click on that and then you can see how to answer questions as shown on this slide. Um, so I'll pass back to you now, uh, Chairman. So uh, th thank you so much, uh, Gavin, for that. Um, it's my great pleasure now to call upon uh, Dame Sarah Gilbert. Uh, she needs no introduction in our country. Uh, a very uh, well-known, highly regarded uh, scientist for her remarkable uh, contributions to not only the well-being uh, of the citizens of our country, but the well-being of countless uh, billions of people eventually throughout the world through her um, devoted, um, consistent, um, long-standing uh, commitment to her uh, specialist field of vaccinology uh, and, of course, uh, to the development of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, but beyond that, uh, for having ensured uh, over a very long period of time when I suspect vaccine research wasn't at the front of everybody's minds, having ensured that we had a strong science base to be able to respond to this global challenge when the moment arrives. So, so Dame Sarah, uh, over to you, if we may, uh, to open our meeting. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share some slides with you now. Hopefully you've got those up on your screen now. Thank you. So I'm going to talk you through my lessons um, learned in the pandemic looking back this is very much a personal view it's not a polished presentation it's something that we are still coming out of in terms of vaccine development so it's somewhat raw but I think that's the honest way to present it to you at this point um, so I'll take you through what 
what we learned from it. So the first thing I want to say is that partnerships can achieve great things. And what we had um, in 2020 was a new partnership between uh, academic groups at the University of Oxford and actually multiple academic groups, but groups that already knew each other and worked together to a fairly large extent and a big pharma partner, AstraZeneca, of course, who licensed the vaccine technology um, at the end of April um, of last year. And I think that this is um, a, a very good model for future partnerships when we need to um, do something quickly, but also at large scale, because academia can be fast and flexible. We have many sources of expertise available in-house. We have networks of academic collaborators in the UK, but also in other countries, which turned out to be very useful. We could draw on these existing relationships. We didn't have to form new relationships in order to get things moving. Um, but perhaps somewhat unusually, we don't just do the very early um, development of new ideas. Oxford has its own GMP manufacturing facility where we can make vaccines to take into clinical trials. We have a clinical trial centre. We have a lot of experience in developing manufacturing processes and initiating and continuing with clinical trials. And it was really important that Oxford didn't just do the early work on the vaccine, but by the 23rd of April, of 2020, we have manufactured the vaccine to GMP ready for clinical trials. We had all the approvals and the clinical trials started. Oxford then led phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical studies um, in the UK and in um, Brazil and South Africa as well. So if we're going to have um, good transfer of ideas from academia into um, pharmaceutical companies, it's necessary, in my view, to take things past the, the idea stage. If um, academic work is transferred at a very early stage, it often moves very, very slowly when it gets into a, a company. And what was different here was that we'd taken it a long way through um, development. We had a, a manufacturing, a scalable manufacturing process. We were generating clinical trial data, and therefore it was much easier for a, a large pharma partner to step in and take it from there. Now, it's not going to be possible for every um, university and every academic group to have access to such facilities, uh, particularly when we're thinking about other areas of drug development as well. But I do think within the UK, we have the, the possibility of maybe having some hubs in GMP manufacturing, um, also clinical trials, which will allow um, academics to get their early phase work further on in the development process, because that's what's really needed. Uh, and by collaborating together uh, and facilitating access into GMP manufacturing and into clinical trials, we can actually get more value out of the vast amount of work that is done in academic groups and often just stays there because it doesn't move out of the, um, out of the university lab and into the clinic. So that's something I would like to see more emphasis on, getting things moved further on through, down the development pathway while still in academia. And that also goes hand in hand with developing new processes and perhaps new approaches to running clinical trials, which are also beneficial. But there's, of course, no way that a university is going to be able to do the large scale manufacture and also the global regulatory submissions that are needed to license a vaccine to be used across the world. So we really had to move from a, a, um, in terms of manufacturing from a manual, very hands on approach to a large scale systems and logistics approach which is slower uh, to make small amounts of doses, but is absolutely essential when you want large amounts of doses. And the, the two types of um, work together, the academic and the big pharma, was what enabled us to, to move quickly in 2020. But we do have difficulty in the academic groups in that um, funding has moved very much towards short-term funding, short-term grants, often only three years, uh, which may take a year to apply for. And, teamwork, large teams who can do manufacturing and clinical trials, for example, were really essential last year, but it is increasingly difficult to maintain the teams when we have such short term funding. And I think from 2022, that's going to be more of a problem because um, we're finding that there is, we should be applying now for uh, money to pay our staff from next year. And, and there is really not very much available that we can be applying for. So in order to keep the team together, uh, we're going to need some creative ideas. I have to say that we did miss some opportunities to be better prepared. 
um, I had been working in outbreak pathogen vaccine development for some time and was aware of what was going to be needed if we need if we had to respond to a large outbreak or a pandemic. And we had been trying to get uh, vaccine technology development and vaccine manufacturing um, enhanced many times before 2020. I have always found, and my colleagues find as well, that it's never been possible to get funding to develop the technology that underpins the development of all the different vaccines that we then work on. We can get funding for specific vaccines against specific diseases, but to fund the technology itself, nobody was ever interested in that. And we had to do it by a little bit of work on one project, a little bit of work on another. Uh, and then we found some gaps when we tried to put all of this together. We'd also wanted to expand our own manufacturing facility uh, and that hadn't happened. Um, we hadn't been able to um, get funding for our own plans on response to disease X. So although we'd had the ideas, we hadn't been able to put them into practice. And a major problem with producing the doses from clinical trials, that they were made by four different companies, each with a different process and assays. And this was a major difficulty that we had with our clinical trials. Our clinical trials would have run much more quickly and much more smoothly had we had uh, an extended and modified CBF and VMIC um, already up and running, which and then to pass on to a commercial manufacturer after that. And all of those things have been requested, but they haven't been funded. And then we really needed them. It's very difficult to work without those. Finally, um, having a clear and shared goal achieves much more than lots of planning. Grant applications are increasingly large, complex. And last year, we went from concept to 700 million vaccine doses released for use in 172 countries in less time than some ac academic funding applications now take. Our plans were constantly being developed every day, literally. Uh, budgets were reactive and um, we did report um, actual spending, but th the plans changed so often we didn't have detailed budgets to request funding in advance. The decisions were made by those leading the work, not by external consultants to funders who often have a large amount of influence, uh, despite not doing the work themselves. But the UKRI rapid response scheme, I felt, achieved a good balance of information gathering and speed, um, which meant that we could uh, provide an appropriate amount of information and receive funding to move the program forward. Uh, and coming back to the teams, establishing and maintaining expert teams in academia should be prioritized over um, small grants, which run for short times and make uh, building teams very difficult. So I'll stop there because I see that the minister has now joined us uh, and we can come back to this uh, for discussion later. Minister, I, we seem to have lost uh, Lord Kaycar very briefly, uh, but uh, it would be wonderful if you could uh, join us now and give us your remarks. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Minister, welcome. Oh, sorry. I hope you can uh, hear me. I'm so sorry. Um, it's our great pleasure on behalf of the Foundation for Science and Technology to welcome you uh, to this session on lessons from the vaccine programme for UK life sciences. Um, if I may just uh, say that, of course, you're a distinguished member uh, of the House of Commons uh, since May 2010, uh, member for Stratford-upon-Avon and, of course, minister in both the business department and the Department of Health responsible for COVID vaccine deployment, amongst other things. Minister, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lord Kaka. I hope everyone can hear me. I don't think they can see me yet. I can't, I can't, see, can't see. There you are. Perfect. Wonderful. Uh, my apologies to everyone. I've just hopped it back uh, to my desk from uh, an hour long session in the House of Commons. Um, uh, we made some announcements today uh, on step four. Uh, but let me uh, begin by uh, thanking the Foundation of Science and Technology uh, really for inviting me to speak at this webinar. And I hope uh, I, I'll have a little bit of time uh, uh, for discussion around the lessons we've learned from the pandemic and of course vaccine rollout and how we can then build on these close government industry and academic collaboration so that uh, we not only learn the lessons but we create opportunities for uh, life sciences going forward. Um, I don't need to tell the audience here that this has been uh, uh, you know 
probably the, the biggest threat that humankind, that this country has faced in peacetime history. It's this is the most infectious respiratory uh, uh, disease that is aerosol transmitted uh, uh, that man has experienced. And we worked at pace uh, and uh, obviously formed a, a, a plan by pulling people in um, like uh, Kate Bingham and Clive Dix and uh, Ian McCubbin and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, now Richard Sykes as well uh, uh, to allow us to be led by science each step of the way. And I would also like to take this opportunity to also uh, express my absolute gratitude uh, for, for the contribution of the healthcare professionals and organizations across our country, the determination of the commitment of that frontline workforce, uh, along obviously with the support of uh, you know, our armed forces, local government, and the great British public has really helped pave the way out of this uh, pandemic. Um, I think amongst many impressive acts, both large and small, uh, the development and deployment of vaccines has clearly been a, a major success story. Uh, uh, the chances of finding a successful and effective vaccine were pretty low, but thanks, I think, to the uh, brilliance of everyone involved, uh, uh, we have not one, but four vaccines which have received regulatory approval. I'm proud to announce that we have offered a vaccination to all adults over the age of 18, ahead of the 19th of July, today's deadline. I think this is a phenomenal achievement uh, that would not have been possible without the Vaccines Task Force, who really united the efforts of uh, government, industry and academia behind a single mission to find safe and effective vaccines as quickly as possible. Uh, the clinicians whose uh, genius uh, uh, to develop a vaccine, and I know I caught a little bit of Sarah's uh, presentation just now, um, uh, NIHR for their uh, critical work in supporting clinical trials, MHRA and June Rain uh, uh, for providing regulatory approval, that sort of flexibility to, to, to be able to um, uh, take proportionate regulatory steps forward without compromising on scrutiny or safety and security. Uh, manufacturing facilities across our country, including obviously Oxford Biomedica, Wockhart, for uh, manufacturing the vaccines at scale and pace, along with the collaboration of uh, Fujifilm, uh, Biosynth and, and GSK in, in, in County Durham, uh, CPI in Sedgefield, who will help to develop an mRNA library, um, and of course, uh, vaccine companies for working so closely with uh, us to supply vaccines in order to protect our citizens, and of course, the rest of the world. Uh, and um, the NHS, uh, which uh, has been absolute key to administering over 82 million vaccinations across the UK, will also be absolute key as one of our, I think, you know, important, um, uh, uh, I hope, attractions uh, for clinical trials, for uh, 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 you know, being uh, very much engaged with academia uh, and research and with industry. Um, uh, and the Vaccines Task Force success was not the only example of outstanding collaboration between uh, academia and industry, the government and NHS that turned uh, the dial on tackling the pandemic. The recovery trials used the brilliant work of academics, the NHS regulators, and of course, uh, NHS patients to identify new approaches to treating COVID by establishing large uh, trials at pace. The discoveries from the trials have now been adopted globally. Uh, and I think over a million lives have been uh, saved. Um, so in the midst of all its challenges, the pandemic has also, I think, shown that we can achieve extraordinary things if we think creatively and work together um, uh, across organizational boundaries at pace and speed. And so I'm really delighted to inform you that we recently published, uh, you will, many of you on this call will know this, the life science vision, our core ambition and the vision is to take the learnings from the pandemic and the power of collaborations we've experienced and apply them to the quieter but also devastating diseases and illnesses that impact our lives. It's a bold vision, 
co-created with industry, with academia. It sets out our 10-year strategy, uh, uh, co-developed, as I said, with, between us uh, and life science companies, medical research charities, uh, and the NHS uh, uh, to build on that collaborative relationship illustrated in the pandemic. Um, and of course, the underlying um, foundation is the excellence of the UK science base uh, and uh, uh, the scale and potential of the NHS. Uh, the vision sets out uh, how the UK will make a tangible uh, uh, set of uh, uh, targets to progress on all elements of the life science ecosystem, including science and uh, research, building on uh, our deep academic and industrial expertise to develop uh, and trial new medicines and technologies quicker, quicker in the UK than anywhere else in the world. Uh, the NHS as an innovation partner, making research and innovation fundamental to everything the NHS does, uh, which will drive improvements in care quality, efficiency, and of course, staff um, happiness and satisfaction, and will ensure uh, that uh, patients in the United Kingdom are among the first in the world to benefit from new medicines and technologies. Uh, life science business environment, uh, creating the best environment uh, in the world for life science companies to start, to grow and to innovate and take advantage of the uh, regulatory freedoms created by leaving the European Union. Uh, I think our vision uh, identifies uh, key healthcare challenges where we can harness the collaboration and creativity that was fundamental to our COVID response so that we can save and improve more lives. Uh, we will again take uh, a vaccine task force type approach uh, to these missions to develop genuine breakthrough medicines and technologies that improve uh, uh, outcomes and patients' lives. And I will uh, uh, return to the subject of vaccines to give you a, an example of one of our missions. We will uh, draw on our rich history in vaccines. Um, uh, Edward Jenner, smallpox and the uh, milkmaid in the late 18th century through the success uh, of the vaccines task force in COVID-19 uh, to keep the UK at, at the cutting edge of vaccine development and technology and I hope manufacturing as well. Um, modern vaccine technology was the potential. Uh, uh, it has absolutely the potential uh, to prevent and treat a range of non-infectious diseases. So continuing to advance UK capability and capacity in this area can have wide health benefits, as well as support the G7 ambition to have vaccines developed and deployed within 100 days of a future pandemic. To do this uh, uh, in the UK, the UK will, uh, one, continue to improve core immunology, uh, vaccinology and clinical trial design and infrastructure, deepen our experience and expertise in vaccine formulation and delivery, and I hope strengthen and maintain uh, the government industry uh, partnership. Now, whilst there is still a great deal to do to lift the world out of the COVID pandemic and transition it from pandemic stages to endemic, uh, now is also an opportunity to reflect on what we have learnt and how we can do better in the future. That is why uh, we have seized the moment to capture these reflections in our life science vision and to make sure that industry, academia, uh, the charitable uh, sector, regulators, the NHS and us in government continue to work at pace, uh, at scale together to improve and save lives. Um, thank you again for inviting me, Lord Kakar, uh, and for allowing me to speak to such a distinguished audience. And I look forward uh, uh, to a few moments of, of discussion as well. I apologize. My diary today has just completely blown up. No, no, not at all, Minister. We're most grateful to you. I think, Gavin, could you switch on my... Oh, here we go. I've got the message. Start my video. There we go. Excellent. So, Minister, thank you so much indeed for joining us. We're most grateful to you and for your very thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, comments. Yes, of course, uh, you have. And uh, much congratulation to you and others who have been responsible for the deployment of vaccines in our country with the, the NHS, with academia, with industry and with other partners. Um, if I may, I'm going to turn, because we only have you for a couple of minutes, to uh, some questions. And Dame Sarah, ahead of your arrival, uh, and, and indeed others on the, uh, the call, have raised the question of how we're going to ensure that we have the skills and the workforce 
to apply more broadly across the life sciences uh, sector in the future. Uh, what we have learned uh, from uh, this uh, remarkable period in our natural, uh, national history, and in particular, how we can be clear uh, that we are going to uh, attract uh, into uh, the various professions that are required for this great mission, uh, those individuals, how we're going to retain them, and how we're going to develop their skills over time to ensure that we can deliver in the way that you envisage. Thank you, uh, and I think uh, Dame Sarah is absolutely right. Uh, and I see um, two things. One, obviously, uh, our collaboration and the sort of the uh, 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 what began with the Office for Life Science and the sector deals, um, which uh, brings industry along with government to address the challenge around skills uh, that we need to continue. And, and keep driving. Um, but I also see a real role uh, for uh, the department. Um, and I'm talking about uh, Bayes rather than NHS. I'm a, obviously a twin hat and I said in, 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 in DHSC, forgive me, not NHS, uh, in DHSC and, and in, in, in Bayes. Um, we should be the challenger department across government where uh, because we are able to see the whole economy, including obviously uh, uh, this particular sector, uh, we should be able to model through what does this sector need, the economy need over the next five, 10 years in terms of skill sets, and then go armed with that uh, data to the Department of Education, uh, which obviously holds uh, the portfolio and responsibility and the budgets, uh, and uh, uh, DWP. Uh, to say, you know, here is what the economy needs. How are we going to now work across government um, uh, to make that happen? And that same urgency that we demonstrated in our response to COVID, uh, we need to do the same thing, I think, uh, in, in that uh, ability to uh, work with industry and across government uh, to deliver um, the, the, the skill sets that are needed uh, here in, 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 in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for that very full answer. Uh, just, Minister, if we made two other quick questions. I know you have to get away at 6.30 and we're at 6.29, so apologise, <laughs> my apologies. Um, in, in terms of the broader vision that you've described uh, for life sciences, which is uh, very exciting, uh, how, how do you propose that um, the interaction uh, the, the multidisciplinary interaction beyond, let us say, the, the um, traditional partners, but into the physical sciences, behavioral sciences, and so on, uh, is um, achieved. Uh, without it, we're not going to really maximize potential. We've seen in the pandemic how all of these disciplines are critical. Our infrastructure deals with some of the disciplines, but not all of them. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And, and I will not um, claim or um, uh, you know, flannel this, this audience by saying, you know, we've got all the answers in, in, in government. The one lesson we learned uh, through this pandemic is actually the success came through uh, making ourselves accessible. You know, I'll never forget uh, Steve Bates coming into my office and saying, you know, you really should take a close look at what uh, this team in Oxford are doing. Um, uh, rapidly, uh, uh, and I was able to, to sort of play a tiny role in escalating that, that message uh, or cascading it across government. Um, so I, I think you know, part of the answer will lay, it, uh, will lie in, 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 in how we um, uh, uh, are able to pull different strands together um, and take the learnings of VTF and see whether we can we can apply those uh, to uh, the life science vision. Um, and again, uh, part of it is by making ourselves accessible and um, uh, being open uh, to um, uh, put ourselves outside our comfort zones. You know, sometimes the challenge in government, uh, you have some tremendous human beings working in government and civil service, and of course, I hope uh, in ministerial roles, uh, uh, you will agree, uh, but uh, 
you know, we all have our day jobs and it's very hard sometimes when it's forced upon you by a pandemic, uh, then uh, uh, you have no choice. But actually beyond that, you know, the one thing that I want us to keep is that sort of DNA of, of when we move to peacetime, um, uh, I hope we transition this virus from pandemic status to endemic, uh, that we don't lose that same level of urgency that we want to, 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 to deliver um, uh, for um, uh, uh, you know the stuff that's in the in in, in the vision, whether it's on uh, uh, cancer or or dementia or any other area. And finally, Minister, as I know you have to go now, but very quickly, um, we have in addition to all the science and technology and innovation in our country, and I know you are deeply committed in this particular area. Um, uh, also, in parallel, being conscious of the ethics that attend. Uh, life science development, uh, technology and advancement in terms of ensuring our ability to contribute to those questions and adoption at pace and scale for the benefit of humanity generally. How, how would you see the life sciences vision contributing to that element to ensure that we remain leaders in this aspect as well? Oh, um, uh, clearly um, uh, an area of both um, uh, um, clear advantage to us in that we've you know had thought leadership and engagement uh, uh, globally um, uh, uh, on this area so setting uh, the rules of the road uh, uh, as I call them and then allowing uh, uh, innovation science to to flourish uh, and so I see us having a really important role uh, in this uh, globally and you sort of you get a hint of it um, through the Prime Minister and the G7 and talking about how we, we should be collaborating to build a sort of global radar system, uh, not just for COVID-19, but obviously for other uh, uh, future uh, uh, viruses and, 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 and uh, 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 something that, that he absolutely is passionate about. And I think um, uh, is something that we have natural bench strength, if I can sort of describe as that, um, uh, to, to um, uh, take advantage of or, or, or lean into um, uh, as part of our um, contribution, um, uh, but also I think uh, in terms of soft power, um, it, it is in uh, I think I think a fertile area of of, of work for us uh, in, in government certainly. So, Minister, thank you very much indeed. I'm conscious that we've kept you five minutes over our strict instruction. My apologies for doing that. We're grateful to you, uh, not only for attending this Foundation for Science and Technology uh, webinar, but everything that you're doing for our country and the leadership that you're showing. Most grateful to you and thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. So if we may, we're now going to move on uh, to, uh, and I'm going to call upon Steve Bates, the, the third of our um, speakers, who of course is a CEO of the UK Bio Industry Association, very distinguished uh, colleague who has made a tremendous contribution. We heard the minister uh, refer to his uh, contribution with regard to, um, let us say, the vaccine journey uh, during this pandemic. And it's an honour for us in the foundation to uh, welcome you, uh, Steve, to uh, address us now, and then we'll return to some further questions. And, um, Lord, Lord Kega, thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you to the foundation for the uh, invitation to speak and um, perhaps I should as I'm probably uh, less pro high profile than your other speakers introduce myself and my role and it was kind of the minister to say that uh, uh, one of the jobs that I did at the end of February into March last year was take some of the asks from the Oxford team uh, carry the, the messages of the need for money uh, to government and make the case uh, very much on their behalf and I, I think uh, Sarah described her bid uh, once as a radioactive bid for two million pounds and Sandy Douglas uh, uh, was asking for 400,000 pounds for, for scale up. And one of the things I was doing in the conversation that uh, Nadine Zahawi talks about there was explaining that these are absolutely vital steps and vital, very small amounts of money in the grand scheme of what the government was spending, um, carrying them to, to government and they needed to get on with it quick. So uh, that was my small part uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of last year. Uh, as a result of that, um, uh, I was at the heart of putting together a consortium of BIA member companies who stepped up to support uh, uh, Sarah's team and Sandy and Kath's uh, team uh, at Oxford in the 
manufacture of, uh, of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine as it became. And BIA members are at the heart, as the minister explained, of the manufacturing supply chain uh, for, for this country and now the world uh, for, for this fantastic vaccine. Um, my day job running the Trade Association uh, means that I've been involved in life science industrial strategies uh, or sector visions uh, for the best part of a decade. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, what I'm hopeful to do is to take a step back and, and look back on what we've learned from last year and compare them with where, with where we're going. And um, I'm probably more of a salesman than, uh, than Sarah is. So Sarah, I have got your book and I will plug it. Uh, if you're reading on the beach this summer, it's fantastic. Do read the Vaxxers uh, book by Sarah and her colleague, uh, Dr. Catherine Green. Uh, it, it explains the inside story of the Oxford AstraZeneca vet vaccine and the race against the virus. And what I was really delighted about uh, your comments today, Sarah, well, you talked about the centrality and the importance of manufacturing, because I think three things are vital that I've learned from this, this period of time. It's not just about being able to, uh, to invent amazing things, it's being able to scale them and turn them into industrial uh, capability that's vital uh, in UK life sciences and manufacturing is at the heart of that. Um, the minister talked about doing things fast and pace. I think pace is absolutely vital uh, for, for doing things. And I think some of the challenges and some of the lessons are about how do we do things very, very fast. And the other thing that we haven't talked about so much, but I think is also important, is being able to do things at risk. And Sarah talks in her book about doing things at risk and doing things before the paperwork was all signed off. And I think that is an absolutely vital component that many people were working at risk across many parts of the the vaccine program uh, through last year. As a result of the work I did in the early part of the year, um, I was asked to sit on the, the vaccine task force with Kate Bingham uh, and, uh, and was on the steering board of, uh, of the vaccine task force. So I saw some of that. And I think there's some other elements to the vaccine task force, which will have a long-term legacy. One is, uh, as Sarah's talked about, the, develop, the ability to develop at pace and scale uh, vaccines uh, against novel pathogens. I think also we've done an amazing thing in terms of organising uh, clinical trial networks so as to be able to look at things like uh, the recovery trial, uh, to be able to work out uh, how we open our medicines cabinet effectively uh, at pace uh, to get data that's meaningful for the globe. So I think that's another element of the, thing that the, the, the thinking that we should look at. And also we've done some amazing innovation in this country around um, the functional use of genomic data uh, to both understand a, a novel disease. Uh, obviously, you know, Sarah started, but she had the the genomic uh, information to be able to design the vaccine, but getting that loop right between how we get information out, the use of genomics and get it back into the, the discovery scene, I think is really, really, really one of the other learnings that I'll take away from, uh, from this time. And I think we've got it well. A couple of thoughts, uh, if I may, that might provoke some discussion. Um, the UK has been vaccinated largely by the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, but of course the other vaccines that have done a lot of the, the heavy lifting of Pfizer, BioNTech. Um, those of us with long memories will remember that some years ago, Pfizer endeavoured to buy AstraZeneca. Um, if that had merger had happened, would we have had both of these uh, different vaccines being developed to industrial scale? Um, I think it's a, it's a serious question. I, I, I doubt it is the answer. I think thinking about a diversity of industrial players who can uh, who can be in a space and what we need to do to keep a diversity of globally relevant companies at scale in, um, uh, in areas of, uh, of significant health need are important factors to think of. And there's some bleed across here to some of the discussions we have on AMR. So um, industrial diversity at global scale is an important thing I think we need to consider. A few factors that I think underpin some of the success uh, and then I'll, I'll finish. Um, I think that where we've had success in the UK, we've had long-term institutions with, uh, with research focus in the area. So if you think about, uh, about Sarah's work at the Jenner, I think of the Jenner Institute as being absolutely vital uh, and actually not a very uh, old institute, actually quite um, recent in its coming together in its present formation, but that as an institute and its focus has been very, very important in vaccines. The Sanger and the work done there on genomics, again, is another relatively within my lifetime organization that's made a real difference. And the decade of investment under Dame Sally Davis in the NIHR, which actually underpinned the work that was able to be done in recovery trial and our clinical trial capability, means that it's been longish term investment uh, with a focus 
uh, in fundamental areas that have been the thing that we've been able to build on. I think if you add, that, add to that the fact that networked ecosystems matter, if you've got experts with high trust levels who've worked together before, and I think Kath brings this out in the book very clearly with the trusted relationship she had working with Paul and others in the life science, UK life science ecosystem to be able to scale rapidly. We didn't have VMIC, um, it's still not built and it's still not manufacturing. So we had to go with what we could go with. And I think, you know, having diversity in that base with companies stepping forward and themselves taking risk is really, really important. Speed I've talked of is vital and accepting and carrying risk is vital. Um, the state has supported industrial strategy in life science. And I think where we've had industrial strategy uh, championed by, uh, by, by uh, David Willits uh, many years ago, we have been able to then pull on that, uh, that, that investment to be able to, uh, to divert from perhaps the central thing they were doing. If you think about Oxford Biomedica as a, as a company doing cell and gene therapy, they have been able to re-roll into something slightly different at pace and scale with transferable skilled skills and people. And it's often about people and networks that I think is the most important thing we need to take away from this. Having that uh, uh, and helping government understand that as they think through is going to be the key thing going forward. With that, Lord Kekar, I'll hand back to you and I look forward to the discussion. Well, well thank you very much uh, in, indeed, Steve. Mo most kind of you to have made such a thoughtful uh, contribution to this discussion. And there's a lot to pick up on here. We have about 15 minutes uh, left together and a large number of questions coming in on our Q&A and voting system. So the first, uh, Dame Sarah and Steve, is um, a question about whether the life sciences vision that we have heard about in the uh, minister's presentation um, is actually going to be deliverable in terms of the amount of money that needs to be spent across the different domains and disciplines of uh, focus uh, and in terms of having the human resource available in our country to deliver it. I, I don't know, uh, uh, Dame Sarah, whether you would like to, uh, uh, to start. Well, I'm not going to be able to comment on the, the amounts of money that are needed. I'm not familiar with the budget that's been proposed, but um, I do think that we need to make sure that we have the right teams of people with the right skills um, in place. Uh, we were lucky to be able to draw on that to quite a large extent last year, but we still need more people. And vaccine manufacturing is so important. It tends to get overlooked in all the work that we did on the clinical trials. There's a lot of emphasis on the, you know, the, the early stage, the discovery work, which was actually um, repeating work that we'd done previously. So we had a template to follow, we're able to go quickly. Uh, and then the clinical trials obviously are a major undertaking, but in between there's the vaccine manufacturing, uh, all the regulatory applications that you cannot move into clinical trials without that. And it really requires a lot of specialist expertise, which we're unusually fortunate to have in an academic setting, but we need more of it um, in more academic manufacturing facilities for drugs as well as vaccines. Um, and so we need to build that skills base and make sure we've got the, the skills that you don't often find in academia to work to GMP, not just to work in a research lab. Um, and then I don't see that being needed in every university, but when we have hubs and the VMIC will, will be one of those hubs, maybe we need more than just VMIC. Um, having collections of people who are able to take things from the discovery stage into GMP so that they can then go into clinical trials is what we're going to need if we're going to develop more products uh, and develop them quickly. So Steve, how do we ensure that we, we achieve this resource? You're very good at negotiating with government clearly, uh, ensuring that the case is made uh, with a broader bio-industry uh, um, uh, focus, which, as you've demonstrated, includes not only industry, but also uh, academia. Um, how do we achieve this resource? Are you confident that the life sciences vision is going to be able to mobilise that resource, both from private and uh, public funds? It's certainly a big part in helping make the case. I mean, I think one of the things that, um, that uh, this experience has shown is that the the strength in depth of the, the UK life science offer and our ability to work together is attractive, uh, I hope, to the public. And I think the public can see the, the benefit of this now in a way that perhaps was, was less clear and people like Sarah leading that line and, and, and it becoming a public discourse is really, really, really important to attract um, you know, societal support for investment in this space. So I think you know, the case is, is made more clearly. But I think also we can leverage in a lot of private sector investment into this space. We shouldn't only look to government. There's quite a lot of people who will want to invest in, um, uh, in health uh, in healthcare. Uh, we've seen a significant investment from global players in 
Fujifilm in the Northeast, uh, for instance. Uh, and, uh, and I think that there is an understanding that uh, there is going to be a need for uh, more strength in this, this capacity. I suppose I'm, my, my question to Sarah is, we don't need necessarily all of this to be in academic settings. I mean, we've got some fantastic companies. And what's interesting from my perspective is how much fantastic science, and particularly this science in bioprocessing, uh, is done in, in companies. And I, I think that we, we shouldn't be shy about saying you can have an excellent scientific career, not necessarily in, in an academic setting. But what's amazing is when you get the, the academics and the, um, uh, and the companies who've got some of this working together, as Kath's chapter in, in your book show has worked fantastically on this one. So I think it's right that, and it's, it's fantastic that Oxford have got the facility that they've got. I think it's brilliant that we've got VMIC coming, but I think we should, shouldn't underestimate the scientific prowess and the capability to solve problems that we see in uh, some great companies that have got a significant footprint in the UK. Do, do, do you think there's a, an appropriate, uh, uh, James, sorry, appropriate uh, um, let us say, exchange and interface between uh, academia uh, and industry and small companies and commercial investment and public investment to achieve the ambition with regard to uh, the scale and um, broad base of resources that you speak to in terms of being able to deliver the research agenda? Well, I don't think it's a research agenda. I think it is a uh, delivering on a health agenda for, for, for the globe. So I think the mistake is to think of this as a research agenda. I think this is about uh, thinking about it as a as an outcome, you know, with with health outcomes, and that's really where you get the mission which everybody can buy into. I think if it's purely seen or seen as a research agenda, we we think about it wrongly, and we invest in the wrong skill sets, and we probably don't end up with the right institutions that can deliver um, because um, because the incentives are are, are different. But I, I think there is great interfaces, and one I would say that's vitally important is the bar at the UK Bioprocessing Conference because. Oddly, it's where trust relationships build. And that's why, you know, Kath was able to pick up the phone to people in, uh, in, in a number of companies to be able to get those crucial steps going. And, and, and Sarah talked about the, 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 the not having standardised assays as being a problematic and it'd be great if we had one at the beginning. I mean, that is the joy, of, uh, the joy and challenge of, 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 of innovation in this space. Uh, I think it's great that we had several shots on target because... If you don't have those shots on target, you don't quite know whether you're going to get there. And you know some of the innovative steps that that, that Kath was pioneering with didn't come off first time at this time round. And 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 that's right. We should, we do need to encourage that because that is ultimately how you get these things to move faster. But but uh, Sarah, do do you do you feel that um, there is the the flexibility and the opportunity for the interface across all these different domains? for us to be able to deliver the health agenda rather than uh, uh, to, 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 to focus on what might be more traditionally seen as the role of universities in terms of driving the research agenda, both uh, basic science, translational and clinical research. I think we need to make more of the, the opportunities to work across the different sectors. Uh, and we haven't talked so much about the small companies. Um, small companies often have um, a really good core team, but then don't have the access to facilities to, to develop further. Uh, and that's where interactions between academia and the, the kind of manufacturing groups that I would like to see more of in the UK can actually be really beneficial. And it, it, it doesn't have to be that the um, ideas spring from academics uh, and then get developed by somebody else. Um, sometimes they could come from a, a small company uh, who then wants to tap into the expertise of an academic group to help them move on to the next stage. I think we should be maybe looking a bit more flexibly about how these relationships can work um, and being also prepared to have larger groups working together. We have to consider the intellectual property requirements as well, which complicates matters. Um, but I think it would be good if we had more of a team approach across academics, small companies, and then sometimes large companies supported by infrastructure within the, com within the country that all can tap into. Do you think it's possible for our, our scientists, clinical scientists and others to move between industry and academia and the health service seamlessly so that they can be both developed and then uh, deliver their talents and skills across these different domains at different stages in their careers and their contribution? I think it's something that, that, um, that could happen. It doesn't happen very much at the moment. So I did work for a biotech company for four years before I came to Oxford. 
uh, and that was a good experience and I learned a lot from it things that I I still go back to things that I learned then working in biotech uh, the reason I left was because the company was being sold by its parent company the research was um, being cut back on and I wanted to get back to research so I came back to academia and found enough to interest me um, ever since but uh, so I think in in small companies there's often a lot more movement between uh, different companies because uh, things are, are more transient but I don't see why we couldn't also have more movement between uh, academic small companies and large companies uh, in order to keep things um, moving and keep, keep the uh, skill base developing. Yeah, I think there's some really interesting schemes that I think are, are in the strategies to, to try and encourage this. And it's fantastic to, to, to see the experiences of people who, are, who do work at those interfaces. So there's some good schemes in the Academy of Medical Sciences to encourage that. I think the Royal Society has some things that enable people to to try before you buy, if you like, and and and, and have a day a week in, in, in places. And and I think um, I, I see with some of the younger researchers that I see a, a greater flexibility and a desire to try and to do it in many different formats across their career. Um, I think we need to make sure that people are aware that, that it's possible. And I'm actually trying to go the other way, Sarah. I'm trying to find an academic partner who will have me because I left university a long, long time ago. I feel like I don't, don't know the space very well. So I'm trying to go the other way. And if you know anybody or anybody on this call knows anybody who wants to have me come to their academic group uh, a day a week for a year, I'm keen to... to, to I suspect that. You're, you're going to be overwhelmed. Let's move on uh, to the question of zoonotic infection and uh, human and animal uh, infection and whether uh, there are both the, the, the funding and the willingness to look at uh, platform technologies that are going to help us prepare uh, better for the next uh, zoonotic pandemic bearing in mind both human and animal health? Yeah, this has been a problem for a long time because uh, there are very many uh, zoonotic infections, but there is not the money to develop the vaccines for, for livestock. Um, we can use the same platform technology in humans and in livestock. We don't necessarily need the same manufacturing process because we need it extremely highly purified for, for clinical use, but it can be a, a slightly more rough and ready, less pure and therefore cheaper process when we're using it in the livestock. We're not as concerned about the possibility of a, a small number of um, uh, things being carried over from the, from the manufacturing process. Uh, and we do need the cost to be low, but I'm not aware of schemes that allow uh, the co-development of human and veterinary vaccines. And it does actually make a great deal of sense to be able to do it. Yeah, and, and I would agree. We, we're going to have, I think, a period of time, I hope in the not too distant future, where we're going to have decent capability to manufacture at scale. One of the things we're going to need to do is keep running uh, at some level, which is above uh, the levels we were before pandemic, but won't be at the levels that were uh, that are needed during a, a, a pandemic. So one of the ways you could think about this is there might be an understandable desire to keep that ready and practiced a uh, community that can make stuff at some volume one way you could think about doing that is well let's make some stuff for the animals uh, and and the question is then how do you set that mission up so that you, you you're, you're solving some of those problems uh, and keeping the manufacturing uh, gear running at, at, at enough readiness excellent so i mean it is an important question and let us hope that uh, uh, we can we can mobilize um uh, the, the commitment to resource because it is a very very serious question but there's another question here that uh, has generated a huge amount of interest and that is the, 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 the question of global collaboration and particular European collaboration, European research and European scientists in terms of the, the, the program of research uh, Dame Sarah that you have promoted. How, how much do you uh, rely upon and give credit to that and how much uh, uh, how do you think you're going to go about being able to secure that in the future? Well, we've always had um, many different nationalities in our vaccine team from Europe, from other countries as well. But there's been a lot of exchange with Europe, obviously, because of the, the mobility schemes that have particularly um, enabled that to happen. Um, also, European funding, which tends to fund large consortium grants, which are great ways of bringing people together uh, and sharing expertise, uh, learning about different research groups across Europe. And um, I've taken part in some of those large grants, which um, currently we are coming to the end of. So we do need to make sure that we can maintain mobility of, of staff. Um, people tend to come on the whole for fairly short periods of time and then often go back 
to their home country, but maintain the collaboration. And this is a really great way of um, getting scientific collaborations around the world. It's going to be very difficult if we don't have uh, that continued influx of um, skilled researchers coming to us to work with us and then continuing to collaborate with us on a long term basis. And Steve, anything to add there? Industry is global in nature and supply chains are definitely uh, inter international and certainly if you think about it, there's a, there's a European supply uh, community that's been built over 40 years. I mean, I agree with Sarah, I think access to talent, I mean, we need to uh, uh, inspire people from around the, the, the world and hopefully from, from around the country to, to go into, into our industry and into our sector. I think... Um, I hope that we can attract as many people uh, and partner with people in the global south as we can uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and the key thing for me is, uh, particularly if factory manufacturing gets closer to those things, you know, there, there is lots of, lots of this that can be done. But yeah, it's absolutely right. This is what we mustn't do is uh, pretend that this was, uh, was done sort of within a, a national boundary. And if you look at the vital role that Advent played in, uh, in, in scaling some, some, some of the manufacture or, uh, how uh, UK people went to help the Helix plant get up to, to yield values. Um, the, the, the reality is, is that this was always done uh, beyond national boundaries, uh, although obviously some of the procurement is, is, is fundamentally uh, tied up to, uh, to UK government or, or, other, or other institutions uh, that, that, uh, that, that are important to take account of. Well, look, thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, our, our speakers this evening, Minister Zahawi, uh, Professor Dame Sarah Gilbert and uh, Steve Bates for uh, remarkable contributions. Uh, most grateful to you all. It's been a very interesting topic. We could have discussed it for hours to come. Uh, there is so much to learn from the remarkable journey that you have all been on and the remarkable contributions that you have made to the people of our country and globally and much that we must take uh, from those experiences and try and embed in, in uh, the vision for life sciences in our country. This is the uh, last event in terms of foundations uh, program for this uh, academic uh, session. The recording from today's uh, uh, webinar will be up on our website uh, tomorrow and we'll re re reconvene in October where we will start to hold hybrid events in person and online the first event of the um, autumn programme will be on the 13th of October when we're going to discuss the government's innovation strategy joined by the Secretary of State, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, with uh, a number of other speakers. We look forward to welcoming you all then. And in the meantime, thank you to our marvellous uh, panel, to all of you for contributing. Uh, and uh, I wish you all a very happy summer. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>